This is episode number 59, featuring artist Shelby Keefe. Welcome to the Plein Air Podcast from Plein Air Magazine. I'm your host, Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. In the Plein Air Podcast, we dive into the world of outdoor painting, called Plein Air Painting. For those of you who don't know, Plein Air in French essentially means open air or outdoors. The French say Plein Air, others say Plein Air, it doesn't matter how you say it. It's a huge movement of artists going outdoors to paint. This podcast is brought to you by Painting Cuba. We did a historic trip last year, and we were able to get in before the government allowed it to happen. And then the government opened everything up, and now they've closed it down again. But fortunately, we had planned another trip. We have permission. We have all the paperwork. But this is probably the last chance to get in. We have a group of 50 painters and only a few seats left. We're going to stay together in Old Havana, paint there every day, see some of the culture, the Soroya paintings, the Hemingway House, but painting the beautiful Cuban culture, the dancing in the streets, the colorful buildings, the people. They're wonderful. It's all about painting with friends, making new friends, and paintable scenery every day. A lot of paintings. So... Only a few seats left. You can learn more at PaintingCuba.com. It is my desire to see more people fall in love with plein air painting like I did. And I think you probably have too. You can help by sharing this podcast with others. We are now up to, believe this, 158,000 listeners. 158,000 listeners. I can't believe it. About an average of 18,000 per episode but we've had 158,000 listens so far, and that's what we can tell. There's a lot of information we can't get. But uh, share it on social media. Tell others about it. If you have feedback or interview requests, reach me, eric, at plenairmagazine.com. The interview is brought to you also by the Plen Air Convention, which is going to be in Santa Fe this year. Last year, we had about 1,000 people. This year, it's going to be bigger. And we have indoor sessions teaching you from the great masters, teaching you how to paint, teaching their techniques. And then every day at the end of the day, we go out and we paint together. It's quite a sight to see a thousand people painting together in one location, being part of history. So join us at the Plein Air Convention, plenairconvention.com. Well, let's get right to our interview with Shelby Keefe. Well, today we have Shelby Keefe on the line and Shelby has become uh, uh, an inspiration to me. She's become a a good friend and is a fabulous painter and actually is one of the top selling DVDs that we have, which was a real breakout surprise for us. And so Shelby, welcome. Thanks for having me. It was a real great surprise for me too, to have that DVD be so popular. Very tickled about that. Well, you know, I think it's really been, been interesting to watch your career because I know a little bit of your story because we did an interview on the DVD once before. And, and we'll talk about that. But what has fascinated me is, um, you know, I kind of had this sense that you'd been around and it all really kind of happened very fast. I know you'd been around, but in terms of the national scene and gaining popularity, um, that's all fairly recent. Yeah. And I think it took uh, stepping out and uh, taking the risk um, of applying to the, the more national plein air competitions like Easton. Um, before that, I did Door County, which was kind of in my neck of the woods. But but honestly, after you know Easton in 2010, when I got in for the first time, that's when I started uh, setting my sights higher and you know deciding that I needed to get more visibility, not just in my, my wonderful state of Wisconsin and locally southeastern Wisconsin, Milwaukee, but but beyond, because you know, after you get to be a certain age, you you're like, okay, what next? <laughs> so, uh, well, so I think yeah. Let's back up mm-hmm. because a lot of people don't know what the heck we're talking about. So let's kind of start from the beginning. You, um, you were a local uh, Milwaukee area painter, and had mm-hmm. how did that all begin? Well, um, I've. I, I went to college here in Milwaukee. I'm from southern Wisconsin, and 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 basically, I moved to the big city. I love love the activity and the culture and everything. So, I even though I had to make a living as an artist, which was uh, graphic design, which a lot of us have have started out in, um, I always painted, even when I did my full time 
uh, graphic design jobs, whatever they were. And so, because I had a passion for painting, you know, college really showed me uh, the medium that I wanted the best and that I thought was the most, you know, I could utilize my drawing skills and my color, which, you know, of course, translates into painting with oils or whatever, watercolor, acrylic, but mostly oils. So I was always putting my work out there in uh, local uh, group shows. We have, we have a League of Milwaukee Artists um, and, and whatever else came up that gave me an opportunity to show my best work at the time. And um, as time goes on and um, you put your stuff out there and you get rejected, but you also don't, you also get accepted. Um, I, I was starting to get uh, noticed by uh, corporate art uh, uh, consultants and um, they got me commission work. Um, I was starting to get some awards here in Milwaukee. And then a big one was when I uh, did an art fair here in Milwaukee. I, I, that was kind of another way to do my fine art was to apply to art fairs and do those where you set up your booth and you stand around with your paintings for a weekend or whatever it is. But there's a really great art fair here in Milwaukee. And when I finally got into it in 1997, I, I just had this, wow, I just did this body of work where I, you know, everything else could just wait. And I just <laughs> did a whole ton of Milwaukee paintings. And that was when my town of Milwaukee came and saw what I was doing. And so I got some uh, pretty quick recognition from, from the community here and then, you know, I would apply and not get in, and then the next year I would get in. It just was kind of a gradual thing. And um, uh, so whenever you're in your local art community, your local city, there's all these opportunities to get your artwork in front of people. And as a young artist back then, I was even hanging my work in hair salons and cafes and things like that, which, you know, now I don't do so much anymore. But um, Well, because you don't have to. I don't have to anymore. Right. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, because it's, you know, I mean, at that time it was about uh, getting noticed, getting, what do they say? Uh, exposing, getting exposure. So I was also doing, you know, talking about exposure. I was also doing a lot of uh, donating my art for fundraisers and, and all that kind of stuff that many artists get asked to do. Um, and now I pick and choose those things very carefully. Now, I, so, I, I want to <laughs> stop you there because you're, you're sure. like um, motor mouth here and I have to, I have to step oh, in. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when you were, do, if I remember correctly, that, that when you were doing all that, you were also raising a couple of kids. Yeah. Yeah. I have two boys right now. They're 25 and 27 going on 28. So, so yeah, back in the early nineties, um, you know, that I was a mom with two young boys. So it, I did very, I did not paint that much. Were, were, you, <laughs> a, were you a single mom or were you married at the time? Uh, at the time, no, um, I was married. Um, uh, it was the end of the nineties when I got my divorce, but, um, so I did have the, the help and, and well, obviously dad would be there for his sons too. So, um, I, it was, but it still was a balancing act. So, um, to try to, um, uh, do my graphic design and bring in money and then to also paint, uh, what I really wanted to do, give myself assignments. Um, I took classes from, like adult classes. So I was, I had those assignments. I, I had fun doing and then being a mom and then, well, I had to be a wife too. So that's another, another important uh, thing to do that takes time. So, so you, the, I think, I, I think you're an inspiration to a lot of people who have had to, are, are going through that. So before, before we move on to the rest of the direction, um, you know, what are some of the lessons that you learned that you might be able to share that would be helpful to others that might be going through that? Well, um, I guess having faith in yourself as, you know, and, and faith in your heart, um, obviously faith in, in the higher power, just that 
you are put on this planet for a reason and that reason you don't want to just ignore it um and so having that faith and trust in yourself and the higher power and doing the work plus keeping a positive attitude which is really hard sometimes um i generally have a positive attitude and i think that helps um so it's kind of kind of a nebulous thing but it's it and it's also a practice it's like a daily practice of staying um positive about yourself and about your work and that what what you're doing is vital and important and um the big part for me was that if i don't do this work for myself to help myself grow and be a good person i i won't have it in me to be that good person for my kids or anybody else around me cuz yeah, i you know so tony robbins the the uh, motivational coach or whatever he is yes. said, always says that you know it's like the airplane put your os- oxygen mask on before you <laughs> you can help others and yeah. you know i i know that uh, sometimes my wife will say you know sometimes i feel like it's a completely thankless job you know the kids have to be fed. We got to take care of them. There's all this stuff they have to do. They never say thank you. They always complain, <laughs> and uh, it can get you down. So I, I I think that it's pretty amazing that you you managed to juggle all of that. You know the the kids, the the husband, and also the career. Yeah, yeah, and it and it came with support too. I I have a very supportive mother and father and and uh, siblings and and a wonderful friend base here in Milwaukee and it's amazing what your dear friends can do to help you you know even it just encourage you and to say those things you need to hear even if you know it in your heart but when you hear somebody say it out loud like you can do this thing or you're you know I know you have it in you you know all of that stuff just really helps and so it's it's important to get out too you know if you're if you're a young mom or dad and you you just feel like you're stuck in this one place it's nice to make an appointment or a date with uh your spouse and get out of the house and be with one on one um and then let the babysitter take care of the kids so that you have a full rounded well rounded life that adds to your creativity and i mean the whole basket is better when you have yeah. people around you yeah so i remember you telling me that you decided that you had kind of become pretty well known in milwaukee and that you decided you were going to kind of see what would happen on the national scene and you you made one bold move that really kicked it off tell me about that um <laughs> Well, I think um, applying to Easton, uh, the plein air uh, competition in Easton, Maryland, was was a scary thing to do because I knew that that was one of the biggest, bestest ones at the time, um, based on information from my friends that I've been talking to who are plein air painters around. And, um, and so I thought, well, I'm going to put myself out there. I know it's the same week as the Door County plein air, but I'm just going to try. I got to I got to step out and um when I got the notification that I got in I I totally was floored and scared scared to death <laughs> um but it 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 really was a beginning I I met all these great painters and I have to say I was very very intimidated at the time too cuz the top notch work that was being uh painted there was mind blowing and I was I felt like just pretty much a nobody and I tried to do my best work and I don't think I did but I also am glad that I tried my best you know so you all, that you was all. It. that was the plein air part of getting national other than that it was the the um I did the the art fair circuit a little bit where I left Milwaukee and did some traveling uh-huh. outside of the state well, what I what I also remember you saying was that you had um, you entered the plein air salon competition. Oh yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And and I remember I, I may be misremembering this, but I remember something about you saying that you weren't really sure why you were doing it, but 
you did it anyway. And the, the result was that you ended up winning for the year. And that gave you a lot of visibility, a lot of recognition, a lot of confidence. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, you know, I was really happy with a particular painting that I did. I think this was in 2012. And I thought, well, what do I have to lose except a little entry fee money? Um, again, I was feeling like, uh, how dare I even think I could get there or even be considered. But you don't, if you don't stick it out there, it'll never be seen. And so I entered um, a piece that I had done in Frederick, Maryland and was completely floored when I found out I got to be a finalist. Um, it, it just, you know, it, I think it, it just really, I was so honored and crazy, I couldn't believe it, that I think, well, if this can happen for me, it can happen for anybody who's really happy with their work and they, you know, they, they think it's special. Um, you know, so, so it's, I think we all, as artists, really need to put ourselves out there if we want to go forward. And it's risky because rejection is something we deal with, um, but it's also healthy to have that rejection once in a while, maybe more than once in a while, um, because we learn how to cope. And it's actually a good, I think it's a good skill, a good tool to have in daily living, basically. It's, um, how do we cope with this? We don't pound ourselves in the ground. We, we go, you know, it's okay. That was somebody's personal opinion. Um, and I'm going to try it again and then just try again next time. I have a, I have a theory about that because rejection uh-huh. is really a necessity for all of us. And, and, uh, so I- imagine that, uh, every time you, you imagine that you're a, a block of marble, and that every time you get some rejection, you know, you're chipping off a block of that marble and over time, yeah. more and more and more rejection. But what it's doing is it's it's bringing out the beauty and yeah. and the, the sculpture, because I, I think that we have to understand if we look at these things as positives instead of negatives, they can have a mm-hmm. big impact. I, I had a friend that was a sales trainer and in the sales training exercise, she would stand on stage and she'd put. Um, dollar bills all over her body. She'd stick them in the crevices of her shirt and her pockets and her hair and behind her ears. And uh, she would have a salesperson come up and ask her for the order. And every time the salesperson said, uh, ask for the order, she'd say no, that salesperson would pull one of those dollar bills out. And, and the point of it was sometimes you have to just keep asking until you finally get a yes. But it, you know, the, the dollars accumulate. And it's really the same with our self-esteem and putting ourselves out there is that we just have to understand that it's part of, it's part of uh, becoming who we are and it's not a bad thing. Yes, that's very well said. It really is. And I know that there's wonderful sayings out there that Abraham Lincoln said too about rejection. And I mean, it's, it's, it's part of life. And um, we are polishing our our self or polishing who we are by getting through that each time. So how would you describe yourself as a painter? Well, um, let's see. I like to draw. So um, I think that's always been part of my favorite thing to do with painting. So um, I, as a painter, I like subject matter that I find interesting and challenging. So um, I like to paint buildings, uh, lots of architecture, like vehicles, love old cars and trucks. Um, And even I love to do people. I don't do that so much, but um, it's a challenge. And I love to get the paint down by doing a drawing first. So I, I spend a lot of time with that. So that's first and foremost, where I start. And then as a painter, um, I, I put that paint on in an expressive manner where the drawing is the skeleton. It's the bones of the, of the painting. A lot of times the drawing gets, you know, obliterated and painted over, but that's okay. Because as long as my drawing is good, then I feel like I've got, um, good bones for the painting, good composition, the whole, the whole thing. So, um, I also love expressive brushwork. Um, I love the texture of paint um, and light. Yeah, obviously, 
light is what we do as as uh, painters. We're we're out there trying to capture light. And when somebody tells me, I don't know how you how you paint light. I'm like, well, I'm not really painting light. I'm just you know, that's a value that's, you know, that's lighter than this. It's got some color in it. So I'm just being truthful to the scene. What am I seeing? And then I just try to paint what I see in an expressive manner that pleases me. So, um, so my overall, my paintings are realistic, but they're, um, bold in brushwork and expression. And, and I Um, think also very bold in color. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm very turned on. I'm very turned on by your work. Um, I I like it so much and, and it just has this, this vibrating quality. Yeah. And I think that, thank you, Eric. Um, I think that the, um, the color, um, it's interesting because I thought everybody saw the same way, but I'm finding out they don't see color the same way. Um, my mom had uh, recently had um, cataract surgery, and when she came back and looked at white, she said, wow, that's really white. Here all this time it was looking kind of yellowy. So I look at that as an example for how our eyes don't necessarily see color the same from one person to the other. So when I'm painting, I'm actually painting the color that I see, and I might exaggerate a little bit. So um, there's a little bit of added color and shadows and and whites and stuff like that. So, um, I still think I'm not, I'm, I don't, I wouldn't call myself a colorist, but I would definitely, uh, call myself a a bold, bold color person. I don't know if that makes sense. So, yeah, (laughs) well, I think, I think it does make sense. And, and, um, again, I think your paintings vibrate with color so may, maybe not colorist in the traditional sense, like, you know, Camille Prozwatic would be a colorist, but, but very colorful and very vibrant work. So one thing that I always, um, I, I think when you and I first got to know one another, one thing I was very impressed with was the, the series you were doing on buildings in Milwaukee. And I think the, the grand prize winner for the uh, Plein Air Salon was a blue building uh, storefront of some sort. Do you remember? Yeah, that was um, an old historic building in Frederick, Maryland, when I did uh, Easels in Frederick in 2012. I see. And you know, I just I adore old buildings. I adore historic detail and um, windows and all the bric-a-brac and all that stuff. And that particular building just called to be painted. So plus, I painted right underneath it, so the the you know the perspective was kind of like looking up at it. So I think that might have been maybe eye-catching as opposed to being across the street looking at it straight on. Right. Well, so, so I think that architecture is especially hard for me as a painter, and I, I think a lot of people have a hard time with it. Is there, um, I know there are no tricks, but is there a trick? Is there, <laughs> is there something to doing architecture because yours is so pleasing to the eye and uh, there's got to be something that you do that makes that happen? Well, there are a few tips for sure. Um, I, I use my brush sometimes as a, you know, I'll, I'll have, you know how people will size things with the tip of their brush to get size sizing? Well, I do that with an angle of a brush. If I'm not sure what the angle is on that building, because it's, it's not very, it's not a real severe angle, it's a subtle angle, I'll put that brush and line it up with the top of a building and, and I'll see what, and then I'll bring it down onto the canvas and then I've got a clearer idea of what angle that is. That's one little tip I do. Um, do, you, if do, I'm you painting, exa- do you exaggerate your angles ever? Um, I, I, I end up doing a little bit of exa- exaggeration just for drama. So that, that blue building that won the cover, that, that was definitely, um, as you look up at a building, the, the vanishing point is up in the sky, right? So there's another lesson on perspective. So the, so the building got, got skinnier as it went up. So I just maybe exaggerated that a little bit, even though it really was doing that when I was looking at it. So as a, a painter of architecture, somebody who draws architecture, it's nice to have a, a, a knowledge of the, of, you know, one and two point perspective and, and what happens in vanishing points. And, and that's a really easy lesson, actually. That's not hard at all to, 
to learn. Um, I did have an architectural drafting class in high school, and that taught me some of that, um, you know, basic knowledge of, of perspective. And do you, did you go through any of that on your DVD? Because your DVD is more about painting from a photograph. I don't remember. Yeah. You... yeah, I don't think I, I don't think there was a lot of perspective in that, in the, the building that I had in there. Um, but it might be a nice new topic for a DVD is how to do, you know, really get into how to approach architecture and, and how to simplify it. You know, okay. I think people good idea. We'll, it. we'll book it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love painting buildings. And, and, and nowadays, since I've been doing that since college days, which is right back in the early 80s, um, I, I'm very comfortable just drawing buildings without using the tools but there are techniques, techniques and tools to help you see. Um, and another one, real quick, I'll tell you, is if you're painting from a photograph and it's architecture or anything, actually, take a piece of tissue paper over your photo and trace just the outlines. Pull it away from the photo and you've got a more simplified visual of how to get that on your canvas so that you're not seeing all the little details. It's pretty cool. That, that one I teach people when I, when I go in the classroom and I help them see. What are the principles that you use when you're uh, teaching a workshop? Is, is there something, kind of a formula that you try to go through? Well, I, I'm not really. I'm not big on formulas. But if somebody is, uh, when I teach my painting from photographs classes, um, I try to make sure I have some tissue paper with me and that if somebody's having trouble seeing an angle, you just put that tissue paper over the photo and you, and you, and you take a pen and you draw the line and you pull it away from the photo and it's amazing. It's like, wow, I didn't see that the angle did that. And so it's, it's just one of those little things I bring with me. Um, but I haven't really done um, a class specifically on how to paint architecture, though it comes up almost every time. All right. Well, I guess we know what we're going to do next, huh? <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> so um, you you've you kind of moved into this um, this new world of living your life on the on the road, doing a lot of these plein air events. What's that like? Well, I I love getting on the road, and I love my new vehicle now that it's a fabulous Honda Pilot. Um, <laughs> so. And it's, there's something very exciting about having your car all loaded up with frames and, and canvases and your, your luggage and all your supplies and, and just setting out on a journey. Um, I especially love going west when I can I get past the plain state and you start seeing the mountains. Um, and then, you know, doing these events um, when you have your own vehicle it means you don't have, you didn't have to ship anything and, and you've got your, your mobile studio. So, I mean, I bring everything with me, including my coffee maker. So, um, you know, you can, you can do that when you drive. Um, but, um, the best part is, is getting into town and seeing your friends. I just love you know, meeting up with my buddies, my painting buddies, it's, it's just like, wow, this is more fun than anything. Um, and even though it starts to get stressful, because he's like, okay, we only have actually only four full days to paint, so I better be on my game. Um, there's always that. Um, but just painting with friends and, and going to the, the evening events or whatever it is, it's, it's very rewarding. And even though there's, even though it's, it's a job, um, I wouldn't trade that job for anything. So, so you don't, you, do you really get to paint with friends though? Because if you're painting side by side, you're painting the same viewpoint or the same painting and you're in com competition in the show. Is there, is there really a lot of side by side going on with friends or is it? Yeah, well, it depends on who you are. Some people absolutely insist on painting with other people. I like it both ways. Um, and, and I have special friends that I make a point of at least, you know, if they're in the competition with me, I make a point of at least painting with them once or twice. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I tend to be a little bit more of a loner because I, I am very serious. I've, I've realized that after the last uh, plenary event I did in Texas that I, sometimes I, I take myself too seriously and uh, I want to 
lighten up a little bit. So um, I am very serious and I want to do my best work and I, you know, I really hope to sell and, you know, awards are, are always, you know, an added bonus, but not no guarantee. Um, but uh, being as serious as I am, I sometimes don't want to wait around for somebody, you know, to decide where to paint or whatever. And I just go off and do something. So I think we all have that uh, kind of a balance. From, from your perspective, uh, as an artist who does a lot of shows, what do you think makes a great show? Well, planning and a lot of the um, the events are very good at um, giving opportunities for patrons to meet you and to get to know you and want to collect your work. Um, there's That's very important because we wouldn't be doing this if we weren't going to sell work. I mean, we love to paint with each other, but selling is kind of very important for us as a, to make a living. Um, so getting the patrons involved, um, having, um, I guess just, I mean, there's so much to, to running an event. Um, and the biggest, the biggest thing is, is having the incentive for the artists to travel from across the country to come to your event. So when the incentive is award money, um, patron base, um, and then there are just some really friendly, wonderful um, people out there, host families who put us up so we don't have to buy a hotel room. Um, we've made so many great friends in these different places. Um, but I think the shows that are the best are the ones that are the well-oiled machines where they have um, uh, specific um, things that they do every year that people can count on. Like in Door County, they have a sunset paint out in the middle of the week on Wednesday night. So we always know we're going to go do the sunset paint out and they get a ton of patrons in there and, and it's a lively thing. And, um, you know, it's a lot of fun for the artists and for the patrons. So, um, I just think, uh, an organized and well-planned, um, event is is the kind that actually does the best for everybody and there's quite a few good ones out there and there's even brand new ones that that are coming up that seem wonderful so and and how many will you do in a typical year i think i counted seven last year um six or seven uh i know that more can be done but i'm trying and this coming year i, I don't know if i'll do that many but um it seems like uh, in the high season, I might do two a month, um, but really one a month is plenty. <laughs> so, um, yeah, everybody's different, six or seven maximum. Yeah. yeah, that's a lot. I talked to somebody recently who did 19 shows last year and it about killed him. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> but he was making, yeah, they, he was making good money. Yeah, the older you get, though, the more you want to save your body. <laughs> I think, I mean, really it's, it's, it's grueling and you don't want to be tired when you're driving home and all that stuff. So, yeah. um, you know, plus a lot of us now are getting to the point where, um, we need to do our studio work and there needs to be time to be in the studio to do that work so that our galleries have, have some fresh new work. So that's, that's part of that whole puzzle piece of making a living as an artist. So when you're out on the circuit and you're doing these uh, shows, your intent is to sell everything that you paint at the show, and yet you probably want to preserve some of that so that you can bring it back and do studio works. How do you create that balance? Well, I my I'm <laughs> I'm an optimistic person, but I can't say that I ever expect to sell everything. That's <laughs> that's kind of hard to to put in. In fact, I don't think I ever sold out. Um, unless it was a show that only you could only hang four pieces, um, and that happened maybe once. So, um, but I, I, I end up coming home with work, generally speaking. Um, sometimes my best work comes home with me um, for some reason, and that's okay. And when the best work comes home, sometimes those are the ones that you submit to the planner salon. Sometimes those are the ones that go into American Impressionist Society, OPA, all of those. So they, they certainly don't go to waste. Um, 
and and so again, it's a it's a balance of of uh, you hope to sell at least you know enough to make you need to sell more than to break even because what's the point? Right. Because <laughs> we're trying to be living at this, but um, when you average it all out, it ends up being a profitable business. I mean, you can have a show where you only sell one or two, and it wasn't you didn't make a ton of money, but maybe the next show you sell you sell five. So and and get a war an award on top of that. So it's it's you just don't know. And I think just keeping that positive attitude and having fun and and trying not to be so serious like I can be sometimes. <laughs> like I never I never thing. look at you as serious. I still remember you on opening night of the plein air convention. I think it was the year after you won the award doing a painting on stage, dancing around on stage to music that you had created yourself. I can't possibly think of you as serious. Oh, <laughs> well, good. That's okay. I, I don't <laughs> want to be too serious, but that that is fun. You know, stuff like that is is uh, really gives me joy when I can throw the music on loud, you know, and, and, and allow the muse or that which comes from somewhere else to come through your arm and make these big, fat, juicy brush strokes. That, I, I challenge everybody to try that, you know, give yourself 20 minutes and really great music and, and a big canvas and see what happens. So <laughs> that, that's a joy. It's definitely a joy. I'll take the challenge this weekend. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> All right. Good deal. So what do you think about this, um, th this movement, this plein air thing that's been going on now for well, for many hundreds of years, but it's really blossomed and grown is, is, um, you know, there are a lot more people coming into it. Is it something that you believe is a good thing? Is it too much? What, what's the story from your perspective? Well, from my perspective, for me personally, um, I'm going to keep doing it until I physically decide I'm, I've had enough, you know, well, I suppose psychologically too. Um, and when it starts not maybe being profitable enough. But I, I think that there is a lot of really great young talent coming on the scene. Um, and it seems like people are coming on the scene with more talent than they have a right to have because they're so young. <laughs> That's not true. But it's like I'm amazed at how many good painters are showing up. And it's a great thing that there are events, too, that are popping up new ones. Um, and, and some very good they, ones. Yeah, yeah. So as long as they're doing a good job at throwing a good event and they're committed to staying out there, um, I think it'll keep it fresh. Um, I think it's natural, though, for older events and events who have their collector bases, you know, maybe they've been collecting for 15 years or more. You know, it's natural if that collector base starts saying, I got enough paintings. Um, but that's also a good event. We'll think of fun things to do that are different than what they've done in other, in, at other times. So, well, listen, um, for I, those, those people who are listening, I just want to tell you, you never have enough paintings. <laughs> it, it's, right. it's true. I mean, and, and I, I know you pretty well and I know that I, and all of us who, who do this, we're, we're so seduced by good paintings that we can't resist them. And yeah, I know that you're probably always swapping with other artists, and and uh, I know I am. Yeah, a little bit. I've actually done more purchasing than swapping, so I have that addiction too. So yeah. I admit it. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as there's any wall space showing, then there's room for more paintings, and then you can build on an extra room, right? Yeah, I'm in this high rise on the seventh floor. I'm not sure they'll let me build out, but <laughs> mm -hmm. I still have a little bit of wall space, so I'll I'll be. <laughs> I'll have to, or, you know, this is what I tell people is forget about the wall space, rotate your show, yeah. take it, take one down, put a new one up. You've got a fresh look and that, that, uh, that works for some people. So, um, I've, I've used that one on people at art fairs too. Well, and it's, <laughs> it's true. You know, it really does work. It's nice to just take some down and put them away for a couple of years and have something new up. And yeah. uh, makes yeah. you feel, or or even just move them around, so because you you get to the point where you don't even notice them anymore because they're in the same place all the time. But when you move them around, they're going to feel differently. So um, we have a lot of um, we we're now up to 
I, I know you're going to just be absolutely blown away by this, but the Plein Air podcast has now reached 158,000 people. And, wow. um, uh, and, and, and average listenership uh, is at about 18,000 people per episode, uh, and, and which is up from last I checked at 5,000. So it's really growing. And one, one of the things that we've noticed is that there are a lot of people who are discovering the, the Plein Air movement and the Plein Air podcast because of keywords that they happen to put into a search and, they just, and they're, they're discovering it and listening and we had, I don't know if you noticed at the last Plein Air convention, but we probably had 100 people, 100 new people who showed up who had never painted before in their life, didn't own mm. any art supplies, and they, they bought everything in the expo hall, and they came to the basics course and learned and learned painting and went out bravely and, and, and learned Plein Air painting with all of us, and it was so exciting. But the point of all of this is that the, the podcast is really reaching a lot of new people and bringing people in and also bringing a, a refreshingly a lot of younger people in. So these people are hungry for tips and advice. What tips and advice do you want to leave them with before we part? Well, I guess the most broad tip I would say is if you, if you, have a desire to paint. If you've always wanted to do it, even if somebody told you you couldn't or that you shouldn't even bother trying, I'd say, go for it. Play with it. Just have fun. Start having fun with it. Get get your get your supplies and your brushes. And even if you just don't want to take a risk on a stretch canvas, get some paper out and just play with color, because color is the candy. Color is the fun stuff. And once you get going and, and, and play with that, you, will, you can move on to the next thing. And uh, take classes, take, uh, uh, learn, learn online, take, get DVDs. And uh, you don't have to spend a whole ton of money to get started. Just, just start and have a positive attitude with it. Well, learning from other people is such a wonderful way to speed up progress. Mm -hmm. um, because, um, you know, they've already gone through all the mistakes and they're going to try to save you all the effort. So taking a workshop, you're, you're doing workshops, I assume. Yeah, I've got a couple lined up for September, one in Door County and one in South Carol Charleston, South Carolina. Maybe I'll get another one on the calendar. I, I haven't made that decision yet. I'm waiting for to see how well my knee holds up. But, well, that's uh, right. Tell us about that because you've been laid up for a little while. Oh, yeah. I, well, I have a, a, a total left knee replacement uh, three and a half weeks ago. So I am I am in my um, condo slash studio and uh, enjoying every minute of uh, enforced enforced vacation. We'll put it to you that way. It's not necessarily easy, but um, I'm not I'm not letting myself paint. I'm actually OK with not painting for this period of time which sounds a little sacrilegious after talking to you about all this stuff, but um, painting is my passion, but it's also my work. So I'm taking a little break from work, and I, it's not to say that I'm not looking through some of my photos that I may want to make a painting of soon when I'm ready. Um, so yeah, so it's been, it's been remarkable um, having this time to reflect and to heal. Uh, well, probably a lot of art books and all of that, too. Well, actually, some some kind of trashy novels maybe here and there. <laughs> um, binge watching. I've been doing some binge watching of uh, Frankie and Grace and some of that stuff. You know, I'm just re I've never had a TV that I paid attention to. My kids got the TV when we went our separate ways. But I have a TV now because I thought I better have something else to do. So, um I promise I won't be hooked on TV once I'm back painting, sure. um, but it's, it's it's part of my vacation, I guess, is oh, to entertain myself. Yeah. Thank well, you. I want to see. I want to see. Uh, you'll have to email me a picture of the first thing you do once you get back to it. We had oh, yeah. um, uh, David LaFell was at. We have a conference called the Figurative Art Convention and Expo Face, which was in Miami in yes. November. And uh, we had about 350 people there, and David LaFell was on stage. And David had had pneumonia and actually had oh. canceled on us, and uh, oh. we were pretty upset about that. But his doctor gave him the go-ahead. But he did his very first painting 
uh, had not painted in weeks, maybe months, but weeks, definitely. Um, and uh, so he did his very first painting on stage, which was kind of cool to watch. And of course, he never lost it. And then he gave me that painting. So it's one of my cherished. Oh, uh, so uh, so I, I need to see the first one you do after your sabbatical. All right. All right. I will definitely show that to you. All right. Who knows what it'll be? <laughs> <laughs> well, Shelby, this has been a pleasure. You know, you're one of the great inspirations of our time and you're doing such beautiful work. And we're all just very happy to be able to look at the work that you produce and be inspired by it and and uh, aspire also to do work like you're doing. So thank you for doing that for us. And uh, it's it's been uh, really remarkable getting to know you over the last few years. And I'm looking forward to the many, many more to come. Great. Thank you so much, Eric. And I will see you at the convention. <laughs> well, thank you again to Shelby Keefe. She is amazing. Today's podcast was sponsored by the Plein Air Convention in Santa Fe. You can learn more at the Plein Air Convention website, pleinairconvention.com, and by paintingcuba.com, a chance for you to go paint with us in Cuba, only a few seats left. Remember, the Plein Air movement is red hot, which is probably why Plein Air Magazine continues to be the top-selling art magazine in America nationwide at Barnes & Noble's. Thank you so much for making that happen. Drop by, pick one up if you don't have it, or get a subscription for half the price you'd pay at the newsstand at plenairmagazine.com. It's always fun doing this. Let's do it again sometime like next week. We'll see you then. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plenair Magazine. Remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye. <laughs>